Wow. 2020. What a year it has been. Let's take a look back at just some of the beautiful moments from this year. Wasn't that great? What is up, Flick fans? Welcome back to my channel. You know what time it is. This is my top 10 list at the end of 2020, my personal best movies of the year. Now, as always, there were plenty of movies I didn't see this year, even though I, I believe this is a record for me on new releases, 238, more than I saw last year, <laughs> a lot of on demand and streaming movies, but I still saw 10 movies that were able to stand out to me. Now, how do they compare to other years? Maybe not as good of a year, obviously, just because we didn't get a ton of movies, but I still feel really strongly about these 10 films, and these are the 10 films that hit me in the best way. Now, of course, statistically, you guys are not going to agree with this list entirely, but I would love to know which one of my 10 movies stood out to you guys the most, and what is your best list, your top 10 movies of the year, and are there some movies on this list that you haven't seen? I know that will be the case. There is actually one film um, that hasn't come out yet, but it will. <laughs> We're dealing with some movies that got limited releases, so I'm counting those on my list, and a couple of films that I saw in some film festivals that could be an Oscar consideration for this upcoming Oscar season. Again, this is just such a different list, so I would love to read through all of your comments, and uh, if you guys are looking for honorable mentions, I did that video yesterday. I counted down my 25 through 11. And of course, if you enjoy these videos, if you like these lists, if you see a movie on here that you enjoyed, drop this video a thumbs up and stay tuned, because if you do, uh, we might have some more lists coming next week. One of the few movies that came out in theaters earlier this year, The Invisible Man was such an awesome surprise because while we got the horror movie that we were expecting, Lee Whannell has done nothing but greatness uh, recently with Blumhouse, so I should have expected it to be this good, but he also inserted some other genres in here that took the movie to an entirely new level. Horror sci-fi, uh, a lot of thrilling elements, a bit of a, a drama at times. It's just everything you want, but it's not this crazy, messy, incoherent uh, uh, Blumhouse film that maybe some expected. It's put together in such a way that is intriguing. The movie looks spectacular. It is shot so well. But Elizabeth Moss stands out as still one of the best performances of the entire year. It takes these twists and turns, and not everyone's going to like the sci-fi element, but I thought it just added a new flair to a film that already was thrilling and entertaining and intense, and the way that this film ends, I thought it was awesome. The Invisible Man isn't a perfect movie, obviously, but for me, it was definitely thrilling enough to go in my top 10, and it's still one of the best experiences of the entire year, and everyone I've recommended it to has loved it, so that's why it's on my list. Look, this is just my kind of movie, right? That's why it had to be on my list. It actually gets a limited release on the 30th, just barely cracking that mark, uh, and then it comes on Netflix, I think, a week after that. This is Pieces of a Woman, uh, starring Vanessa Kirby, who may win Best Actress. It's between her and Viola Davis at this point, but they'll both be nominated. She gives one of the most heartfelt, heartbreaking, and moving performances of the entire year. We start with this heartbreaking home birth who leaves a woman kind of grappling with this emotion and the fallout of a, a few events that happen, and then she's kind of isolated from her partner, played by Shia LaBeouf, and uh, the family is dealing with certain things that kind of amp up the drama, and I will say, the movie is not as good in the second half as it was the first half, but the 20-minute birth scene, stay with me here, the 20-minute birth scene is some of the best acting I've seen all year. It's one of the best-looking shots because it's a one-take I've seen all year. And then the fallout from that, while not as good because it has to be top three moments of the year for me, um, it's still interesting. Think Manchester by the Sea, but dealing with this summary. It's not a movie for everyone. It isn't, but if you're looking for great filmmaking, great performances, pretty much everything you want in a movie like this, uh, Pieces of a Woman does deliver that, and I found it to be 
a beautiful and moving picture, especially kind of where my wife and I are in our lives right now. Um, I, I thought it was great. Here's a movie that you're going to see in heavy discussion for Best Picture. This is Nomad Land, directed by Chloe Zhao. Uh, this film is absolutely beautiful. And when I talk about these, you know, slower, independent movies, not everyone's going to be on board because it's just not everybody's kind of film. And I completely understand that. Uh, but as someone who loves a visually stunning movie combined with great character development. I think that's what you get from Frances McDormand's Fern here. Uh, Fern is a fascinating character. She's on this journey through the Western United States after losing uh, essentially everything in the Great Recession, and she's living as a van-dwelling modern-day nomad. And when I reviewed this film, it was a bit shocking to me how much I loved it uh, because you just... You don't expect a movie called Nomadland, but then you look at the talent. Uh, McDormand is still, I think she's going to get nominated for Best Actress, Chloe Zhao, who is directing Marvel's Eternals, by the way, this next year. And oh my goodness, does she not continue to prove herself uh, time and time again? Now, Nomadland, it is in the discussion for Best Picture. If it were to win, I would not be upset because I do think this movie is great. Maybe the pacing will take some out. Uh, did not me, and I love the fact that they get non-actors to play a lot of these characters, and they were great. This movie's something special, it really is. Here's one that means a lot to me, it really does. This is called The Father, and The Father I saw at a film festival about a month and a half ago will be uh, ready for this year's Oscars. I think Anthony Hopkins will get a nomination, possibly Olivia Coleman, as a man is refusing assistance from his daughter as he slowly ages. He's trying to make sense of everything, and then he begins to doubt his loved ones because his own mind is kind of changing the fabric of his reality. And um, he is approaching that age where you just don't really trust anyone anymore because your mind is leaving you, and that's what Hopkins' character is going through, except we get to see what he's going through. We get to see these instances kind of repeat themselves over and over, different characters coming in. He thinks it's one character, but it's actually someone else. We're essentially seeing this disease uh, play out and come to fruition, and this story of where he starts out and where he ends up has to be one of the most heartbreaking things, and uh, my grandmother uh, dealt with dementia, last year, a year and a half ago, and that's kind of part of the reason why she left us. And seeing this play out on screen, except seeing it through the eyes of his character, the father is fascinating, beautiful, and like I said, heartbreaking, and everything you want in a movie dealing with this, it will be a little much for some, absolutely, especially if you've had a family member uh, who has had to deal with something like this, but uh, I was moved beyond belief, and it has to be one of the most moving movies of the year. The Father uh, is excellent. I just recently reviewed it, A24, directed by Lee Isaac Chung, and it's one of those beautiful, kind of slower-paced movies that maybe you're not expecting to move you in the way that it does, but once you sit down and just ingest this story about this Korean family who's moving across the country to Arkansas to start a farm for his family uh, and for the betterment of the way that they live, and then you see the progression of the story, right? You have the, the kids who are trying to get along with their grandmother, two completely different cultures at play because she came from Korea to live with them. Looking at the visuals here, the way that it's shot, I mean, it's got to be one of the best-looking movies of the year. The direction from Lee Isaac Chung is excellent. And I was afraid for a while there that A24, you know, sometimes they deliver a, an outstanding top 10 film, and then sometimes there's a bunch of movies right outside the top 10, so I'm like, oh, I may not have an A24 movie in my top 10 this year. Sure enough, Minari comes along, a uh, riveting, beautiful, a lovely movie. Again, very much an independent Oscar-ish movie, so if you're not into that, I don't know if you're going to love it as much as me, but I, for one, have found it to be riveting, and Minari is great. Number five, directed by Emerald Fennell. This is Promising Young Woman, and oh my goodness, Carrie Mulligan. Oh my goodness, Bo Burnham. This guy went from being a YouTuber to a comedian to an actor to a director back to an actor, and he's really, really good in this film. But it is Carrie Mulligan's show, and we're following this woman on this journey who is haunted by this tragedy, and she's taking revenge on a few men in her path who were unlucky enough to 
make certain decisions to get her in certain situations. You may think one thing, but I promise you, if you watch the movie, it plays out in such an interesting way. And I love the fact that you're unsure about certain things that are happening. And then I love the progression of the story because I saw none of it coming. All right? I'm still... Not quite there on the ending just yet. I have to go back and watch it again and kind of piece together uh, story aspects in my mind. But, oh my gosh, the fact that I just, I had no clue it was coming. And the fact that this story progression is so interesting. The dialogue is great. The movie has this look to it. The color correction is beautiful. And then you have all of these side players from Allison Brie to Christopher Mintz Plaza to Clancy Brown, Mr. Krabs, his <laughs> supporting cast is great. Uh, I just, I was blown away by this movie. Promising Young Woman, I had no clue it was going to be this good. And it was this good. I loved it. Number four, listen, Netflix has had a great year. A lot of films right outside of my top ten. This is the one that cracked the top ten. This is The Trial of the Chicago 7. Now, if you saw my letterbox, uh, you've seen I've had this high up on my list all year, and just recently, three movies have passed it. Uh, but this is still a great film. Listen, Aaron Sorkin, written and directed by Aaron Sorkin. The only uh, nitpick I have with this film is the way that it ends. It's too much of a crowd-pleasing way, in my opinion, but the majority of the movie moves at this pace that keeps you on edge, on your toes, the entire film. Uh, the way that it progresses is so interesting. The cast, Sasha Baron Cohen, Mark Rylance, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, everyone is excellent. Red Man, I mean, they could all be nominated for an Oscar, uh, but The Trial of Chicago 7 tells an interesting and fascinating true story about a 1968 national convention that turns into this very violent clash with police and the National Guard. Now, the organizers of the protest, they're charged with conspiracy to incite a riot, and this is all about the trial that follows that, except we're getting these flashback scenes, we're seeing all of these cool things play out, and the way that it's edited together and integrated, this is what I look for in a movie, uh, and the trial of the Chicago 7 was riveting, could be your best picture winner. Now look, it's not an Oscar film necessarily, it's not a movie with a lot of action, it's actually at its heart, at its core, a romantic comedy. This is Palm Springs, Andy Samberg, directed by Max uh, Barbaco. Oh my goodness, I had no clue. This is a Hulu original movie, and it has to be, well, it is, easily the funniest film I've watched all year. Could not stop laughing. The story progression is hilarious. It's all about Sandberg's character, Niles, and then you have this maid of honor, Sarah, and they have this strange encounter at Palm Springs during a wedding, but things get complicated as they're unable to escape the venue themselves, each other, do to a time loop. This is Groundhog Day, but with romance and hilariosity, it gets a little bit dirty at times, so it may not be necessarily a family movie, but it's hilarious, y'all. I laughed so hard, and it stood out as one of the most entertaining movies of the year. You have J.K. Simmons chasing him around with the crossbow, and the things that happen along the way, I mean, this is why you watch movies. I watch movies to be entertained, to be mesmerized, but also to be entertained that's why Palm Springs is number three. I'm going to say this and some people are going to be like, wait a second, what? Um, this is another round. It's a Danish film. It stars Mads Mikkelsen. <laughs> Guys, listen, I was mesmerized. I just recently watched this film because it's out right now on VOD. I rented it from Amazon Prime. And, you know, I didn't uh, kind of freak out over getting a screener earlier because I said, you know, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to review it. But I had no clue it was going to be this good. I had absolutely no idea. Mickelson gives one of the best performances of the entire year. And here's what another round is dealing with. Four high school teachers launch a drinking experiment, which is upholding a constant low level of intoxication. And this praise is coming from a guy who doesn't really drink that often. Uh, and watching this movie, for some reason, I'm feeling this just this mesmerizing feeling that I haven't really felt all year. And I'm like, why is this movie so interesting to me? I just love the idea of what they're trying to do. Each character is kind of dealing with something in their lives. And it's all about the fallout of this decision, but the fallout of all of the decisions that they continue to make leading up to this. And then, obviously, you do this and you are school teachers. There's going to be a little bit of trouble. Now, uh, does their experiment pay off? Does it work? Well, it starts out working, but with these kinds of of decisions, there are always going to be consequences, and I won't say what those consequences are, 
But this movie was fascinating, and I'll tell you what, guys. Another round, if this is your kind of thing, and you're interested in the story, and you feel the intensity that I felt in the filmmaking, which is absolutely spectacular, uh, Thomas Vinterberg, who also directed The Hunt, starring Mickelson, then you are going to watch this ending, the final three to five minutes, and I hope you're as mesmerized as I was, because it is the best scene of the entire year. It's the best scene. There's this cathartic feeling that you get from a few moments throughout the movie but oh my goodness the ending of this film man I, this is what filmmaking this is what movies are all about you've got to feel something and it's this kind of writing and direction and the acting is all there and this uh danish movie i believe uh, ended up being my number two movie of the year i had no clue that would be the case but man this is why I love movies. Number one, a huge congratulations to 365 Days or 365 DNI for being my number one favorite movie of the year. This film was riveting. He's joking. Guys, he's joking. It's not his number one. It's a joke. It's not funny, though. He, he, he's not funny. I'm kidding. This movie came out yesterday. It's Soul, Disney and Pixar's Soul. And it's not going to hit everyone in the way that it hit me. Um, there are a couple things about this movie that maybe don't quite fit with the, uh, with the themes here, with what they're trying to do to make this way more adult than some of the other animated movies we've seen as of late. But that's what Soul is. It is a very adult movie intended on a, a specific audience. And I do believe kids are going to enjoy this film. Now, they won't get um, the thematic gut punch that we are going to get with what they're dealing with. It has to be one of the most, I, I use this word a lot, ambitious uh, animated films, but it's Pixar, so you kind of expect them to kind of break boundaries and do something different. And that, for me, is what Soul was able to do. I just loved this movie. I loved it. everything about it. The voice cast from Tina Fey to Jamie Foxx was awesome. The characters were built up beautifully. I do think we could have maybe used a little bit more at the beginning. Look at me. I'm nitpicking my number one movie of the year. I feel like I can do that. Listen, Soul hit me in a way and just kept throwing punches, and by the end, it was a knockout, right? It is such an emotional ride, an emotional journey, and the unexpected things that happen, all I will say is the cat, that's it. Um, you know, at first, I was kind of like, oh, okay, but then as it kept progressing, I'm like, this is actually, yeah, this is interesting. And it all just felt that way, right? The, the way that they pieced this movie together and they put these ideas that I know were just sitting in their heads on screen, uh, the way it was written, man, we've got some geniuses over at Pixar. I mean, I just, I loved this script. It was so different. It's such a different movie. And that's what you're looking for in a film. You're looking for something that stands out. And for me, Soul was the standout of... The year. Now, I know what some of you guys are thinking. There was another movie that was supposed to come out recently, uh, similar to Soul, dealing with afterlife, before life, and that's a movie called Nine Days. Now, that was in my top ten, and I saw it at a film festival, but it actually got pushed to, I believe, July of next year, so I took it off my list entirely. That would have been in my top ten. But we're dealing with similar things here. We're dealing with what happens to your soul, to your spirit, prior after and what is the journey like and obviously this isn't like supposed to be a big factual thing it's just individuals interpretations and it's played out in a really fun way for kids but also a heartfelt way for adults that's what i look for in a movie like this and that's why pixar soul barely another round in soul <laughs> um, is my favorite movie of the year but again this is a personal list not everyone's going to feel the same way what I need to know is, are there some movies that I missed this year? I know that's the case. What is your number one favorite movie of the year? What's the film that moved you the most? What's the movie that you had the most fun with? A lot of the times it doesn't have to be, well, what's the movie that's going to win Best Picture? Sometimes it can just be like Palm Springs, a film that you had a great freaking time with. And that, for me, uh, was my top three, but my top ten for sure. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. My favorite video of the year, man. I love making these lists. It is so much fun. Maybe not as fun as we thought it was going to be. Um, but next up on this channel, other than my weekly live stream, will be the top 10 worst movies of the year, which may be my least favorite video to make. No, I, I kind of have fun with making it. Um, but I need you guys to stay tuned for that and for my best TV shows and Netflix series coming next week, along with the Cobra Kai review. If you guys enjoyed this video, drop a thumbs up. I'll see you soon.